All right. See if this works. Still waiting for the wheel to stop turning. All right, I think I'm live. All right, if you're out there, as soon as you can, let me know if the sound in the video is okay. Let me know when you come in, say hi, howdy, what's going on, whatever you got. Uh, a greeting is always nice. I'll give some time to let some people show up, and then uh, we'll we'll be off and running. It's been an interesting day. We got about two inches of rain the other night, and so it's been muddy. And so I've been um, still doing my walking, still doing all the exercising and all that. But uh, the sun came out a little bit today, like for the last 30 minutes, maybe. It looks, it looks a lot brighter than it is, but we got a little bit of sun today. Tiny, tiny bit of solar, but I was able to get some stuff charged. I am running off a of battery both on the laptop and for the internet right now because there's just not enough power. Anyhow, uh, uh, from the last couple of videos, it's taken about two and a half minutes to get anybody in here and get them to respond. So we'll give a few minutes just so I don't sit there and do an hour show and not know whether anybody's here or not. But there's some things I want to talk about today. We're going to talk about the just-in-time delivery of goods and services and um, the good things that about it and the fact that it's a it is a flaw in the system that um, opens us up to events like shortages and those type of things that I want to talk about. So, all right, if anybody's out there, man, I sure did like this back when um, when it would tell you, you know, you could see people checking in and all that kind of stuff. But I'm doing this on my laptop and maybe it's just the laptop interface that doesn't do that. Ah, <sighs> so that's a minute 53. All right. Doug is first. Welcome, Doug. Takes about two minutes for some reason. I guess people got to know it's on. And what I should start doing is like doing a little song and dance for the first two minutes. And then I can cut that part out and then throw this all up on YouTube. But I'm lazy. So I end up just shipping it all to YouTube. By the way, if you're on YouTube and you're watching this later on, uh, please like this video, comment on the video, share the video, etc. Subscribe whatnot. Um, all the information is in the, in the description. All right. So, um, so what we're going to talk about today is, uh, hello, Russell. Good to see you, brother. Talk about the just in time system. This is a, uh, a thing that I've been talking about for a long, long time. It's in my book, surviving off, sur surviving off, off grid. If you look at it and it reads backwards, it's because of Facebook the way they do it. I've got a section in the book. If I can get this in the camera called Just In Time. And I might read a little bit from it in just a minute. That talks about the fall of Rome and how the Just In Time delivery of goods and services was a major component of the fall of Rome. We have that system in place today. In many ways, it's really, really good. Um, it, uh, it allows for... Uh, economy of scale and, and allows for a lot of economy. One of the problems is, is that when you combine all of the systems that we have, including the fact that we're a very, very specialized people, um, specialized system, people are specialized. They, they don't really have a, a broad range of skills, uh, particularly survival skills, the ability to produce anything. Uh, they are basically taught how to do their particular job, pull the strings, pick at the dot or whatever it is that they have to do to keep the system going. And since they don't produce anything, what they do is they consume by buying from the JIT system. And in order to make that system economically uh, viable, when you have millions of people who are, who are parts of that system and are not actually producing, you have fewer producers producing for more uh, consumers then you, you end up, uh, you know, this kind of system develops where the, the goods to, uh, arrive at the store almost as they're needed. In the ideal JIT system, the truck would back up and the things would get on the shelves and they would be gone, you know, within hours. And, 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 and we might get to see some of that happen over the next days and weeks. 
um, provided everything else keeps going. The, the weakness of the system is that there are there, there is a, a myth in the survival preparedness uh, milieu venue that says that there is always three days supply of goods in the system. That's absolutely not true. Um, that is only true. Soteris paribus, all things remaining equal, which means as long as there is not a major interruption, a systemic collapse, something like uh, a virus uh, that scares people, then you end up with a rush on certain items. Those items disappear from the stores uh, faster generally than people expect them to. And so what we're seeing now is we're seeing this reaction that's a domino effect of people uh, running out. Now, I've talked about this for six or seven days uh, or, or videos now, uh, and I want to but because somebody, this could be their first video that you share this with somebody. It's the first video they watch. I'm not an expert on the coronavirus. I'm not talking about the coronavirus because I don't know enough about it. I probably know as much as you do, but I'm unwilling to uh, get out of my lane and talk about things that I'm not an expert on. I read what I can read and I read uh, a lot of different opinions. And then I try to use reason to figure out what is a reasonably what is a reasonable action. Uh, secondarily, I am a bit of an expert on how to do things, how to produce things, how to uh, live off grid, how to work outside of the grid system, how to work without electric power tools and all those type of things. And so most of the things that that um, fall into that area, I've either done or I've done it a lot or I've done it enough to be to know that I feel comfortable with it. I'm also somewhat of an expert on human psychology when it comes to this particular uh, topic. And so, um, hi, Clyde. Uh, welcome, everybody. As you come in, say hi. Just say howdy, whatever. Let me know you're here. Glad to see you all. Hope everybody's doing okay. Praying for you all. Um, and so the just-in-time system uh, basically means that so long as everything works, then things go along fine. Uh, we have a, a bountiful, uh, productive system that produces way more than um, you would think is necessary for the system to, to, to uh, for people to have their basic needs met. When I was in um, Australia in 2002, uh, went into grocery stores. Uh, it's a great place. It was I was in Western Australia. Hello, Kathy. Um, and but the stores were, uh, were a lot more limited. There might be two or three items at that time. This was 2002, so it was a long time ago. Um, we the people that we stayed with while we were there then came and visited us here, and we took them into a Super Target or something, and their minds were blown at having 80 different brands of you know 10 different items that were in the same subcategory but again those things are delivered just in time and so i'm going to read some from my book about just in time system and what 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 it engenders um but before that i wanted to do some disclaimers i am and and i've got some things that are irritating me so i have a tendency to go off on a rant i just want to say i am not attacking or upset with poor people people who don't know any better, people that are ignorant about things. Uh, I, I have, over the last six videos, defended people that are going out and running out and buying toilet paper because they don't know any better. Uh, they are reacting reasonably based on what they know and based on what they're being told on the television and based on what they see happening. Whether or not you and I agree that that is a, a beneficial thing or whether that's harmful to some people, doesn't matter as far as I'm concerned, uh, people buying things with their own money. Um, if there's uh, a shortage, it's a flaw in the system, not particularly the fault of people who are. And then, then of course, people will throw out these extreme examples of somebody going out and buy five or six buggies. Of course, we don't know. We don't know why somebody's buying five buggies of toilet paper. They could be a church that's going to distribute them to their own members. We don't know. So uh, basically what happens is that, is that people who are scared, unprepared, and a little bit cowardly start lashing around for somebody else to blame for them not being proactive themselves. Uh, and I mentioned all the time that I, I, I would like it if people were always prepared. People always had um, a, 
a, a system at their own house, a store system. I want, I want to get into the history of what the word store means and all that kind of stuff, but bear with me. I'm trying to get all the disclaimers out of the way. And so, um, uh, so the, I wanted to say I'm not attacking anybody. I am a little bit irritated specifically at the uh, currently hyper uh, spiritual people who uh, having refused, no, been warned, having refused to provide for themselves and their families, uh, and and knowing and having the, have had the resources to provide for themselves and their families so that they could stabilize their area and be able to help others in a crisis. Having not done those things, they are now acting, canonizing themselves as saints because um, uh, somehow they're a victim now, and now they're they're lashing out at other people, and they and then there's this hyper spiritualized postings about oh the Lord is going to help me and. And, and, and they, they based basically their entire worldview on a couple of verses taken out of context that don't apply to them. But they've ignored dozens, even hundreds of verses in the scriptures that say, prepare, be prepared. Take, Christ, uh, uh, the, the uh, scripture says that Christ uh, uh, asked us to love our wives as he loved the church. Well, our lives and our families which means he provides for us. We provide for our family. He provides for them through us. But to sit there and not do something and sit there and go, oh, well, God now owes me to miraculously provide me toilet paper or whatever it is because I didn't uh, I didn't do anything that I should have done during the time when uh, it was easily knowable. We've known this for months. This has been out there for months. So I'm not blaming people individuals who are out there who are suffering i'm not blaming poor people and i'm not blaming people that didn't know any better what i'm a little bit upset about is the pontificating from really really shallow people who don't know the scriptures but they're acting like they do and they so here's what's happened for 20 years for 20 years i have reasonably taught people in my own family people in my wife's family reasonably not telling people to go out and build an underground bunker not telling everybody to get off grid not telling everybody you have to live like i do just saying reasonably look at your society and the systems i wrote a whole book about it and said uh look at it find its flaws don't be dependent on it no problem using it but don't be dependent on it. if you have a tool for example you're you work on a high rise and you are, you know, 300, 200 feet, however many uh, feet up in the air, and you have a safety harness, examine it. That's all I've ever said, examine it. And if there's weakness and there's other flaws, take the, take the opportunity when you can, when things are peaceful and there's no rush to prepare, to do the things, minimal things that you can do to stabilize yourself, your family, and your area so that you can help other people. The name of the book is Surviving Off Off Grid. There's two offs by Michael Bunker. I'm going to read from this in just a minute. So what happens is the natural mind is uh, at enmity with God and at enmity with the idea that they have to be responsible. And so being irresponsible by nature, they then lash about using logical fallacies such as, well, we can't all go live, you know, live in a hole somewhere. We can't go live in a cave. Oh, look at you. You've got a a uh, uh, cheap knockoff $18 uh, uh, step counter watch. Oh, who's living off grid? How are you on YouTube if you live off grid? Uh, batteries and solar power, next. But see, the, so they, it, it, it's about ad hominem, then it's about attacking me for telling them something that's true because they're upset. So they take the high road, what they think is the high road. They sit there and go, okay, we're... Uh, we're the holy ones. We're the holy ones. We're not. We're not relying on the flesh. We're, of course, they are. They're idolaters who have relied on the world when God said, don't do that. If you understand typology, you understand the typology of Egypt as the world. And that God told Israel time and time again, don't go to Egypt for your supply. Don't, don't, don't rely on Egypt. And, but they do. And they do it for years after years after years. And uh, and then, so they take this uh, holier than thou. Uh, I've been to family gatherings where I've been talked down to. Uh, not, 
you know, face to face. These are generally not brave people, uh, mostly passive aggressive comments, jokes and things like that. And I've been, uh, you know, with my family, with my wife's family, where people have made comments like that. And you know what? So th they've set themselves up as some guys like the Pope of not worrying. But now, now or in, in a dozen times in the past, things go bad, things get hard and they're uh keyboard warriors angry with people out there buying toilet paper why did you buy it all there's not any left for the poor there's none left for the poor why don't you have it Th anybody could see this coming we were talking about this in february it's it's end of march and so now but now now they're holy and righteous even though they were wrong and 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 now that they are so so they not only didn't prepare for themselves they've subjected themselves to be taken care of by somebody else i call them crypto socialist all the time they they expect the government to do something send us all a thousand dollars do something and and all i've ever said is be reasonable be reasonable look around the system that we had in place first of all, was not sustainable. You cannot endlessly print money, endlessly engage in foreign wars, endlessly bail out uh, every other country, endlessly uh, uh, basically uh, deprive 90% of your own people of their own money while you continue to bail out bankers and everybody else and print money and print money and print money. And then something happens and you go, oh, well, uh, it, it, somebody's going to do something. Some, they will fix it. Their faith is now on them. And, but they say it's on, oh, we're just all going to pray. And God's just a powerful mover. God's going to. There are people who are being executed in other countries who are Christians. Are you better than them? Did, did God abandon them? I don't want to get into a sermon here, but it's ridiculous for these people to sit there now in their high chair or their high tower and act like they're the righteous ones. I'm not letting it happen. You know, you have been warned multiple times in your life that the system that you live in is sketchy. If you say that you aren't, uh, then you are an idolater. In other words, you've begun to, uh, uh, idol uh, um, to idolize systems and governments and things that aren't supposed to be the, the provider for you. And you've had resources and you've had time. So that's the end of my little rant. I'm just saying, uh, just, you know, just shut up. Just shut up about it. Because <laughs> you could be the one helping people. You could be the one providing for, you could be the one going, giving toilet paper to your neighbors, throwing it to them from across the yard, you know, practicing your throw, whatever you need to do. But instead, you're on the, on the computer acting like somehow you're, you know, uh, some saint because you didn't do something because you didn't do something that was obvious that you should have done. All right. I want to get up here. I'm probably missing questions. And then I want to read my little section. Uh, what advice would you give someone who is watching you live for the first time, who has little of any survival bushcraft prepping experience and who hasn't really done anything for preparation for what may or may not come? Uh, where to actually begin as to what to buy first, what skills to learn, et cetera. Those that base, basically has no experience. Um, if you can get it in time, I would read this book because this is a philosophy book and not so much a how to book. Although there are sections on lighting, heat and all that type stuff. And there are examples. Um, I'm sorry, I got messages coming in. All right. So, uh, but there are, there are tons of great books on how to do things, bushcrafting books, just get on Amazon. They're still delivering books. If you can do that, uh, find out how to identify plants and that, that are edible plants in your area. Get yourself some simple tools, a really, really sharp, good knife. Uh, get yourself, well, you know, start looking at at ways to do things. I, it's not really a good venue for me to teach people how to do stuff. Uh, I, I have videos, though, going all the way back. Go look at my um, How We Do Stuff video series on you here on YouTube. Start going through those. There's a lot of great things, you know, get a Dutch oven. They have the ability to start a fire in your backyard in a, in a controlled way so that you can cook outside. Um, uh, it's, it's a little bit difficult to do in the scenarios that we're in, but bushcrafting 
And that kind of stuff can be learned with very, very few, with no money. You can learn, you can learn those things. As long as the internet's up and as long as YouTube's up, anything you want to do, you can learn. Uh, there are, there are a lot of people out there. Cold cracker bushcraft uh, is one of them that I would look at teaching you a lot of bushcrafting stuff. You're right. They're even printing more money and a, a, at the tune of trillions of dollars are being printed. And, and all of those dollars devalue, of course, the dollars that you've already earned with the hours and the minutes and the seconds of your life. Uh, there must be strings attached to the money they're giving. Whether it is or not, it doesn't matter. If um, I explained this to my daughter one time because she didn't understand why just giving everybody, why don't they just give everybody a million dollars? Well, because those dollars in some way have to reflect the value that exists for the production and labor that's in the system. They, they have, there has to be some connection to it. And if you just give everybody a million dollars, then a loaf of bread would cost uh, the percentage of a million dollars that it costs of whatever you have now. Everything uh, prices skyrocket because the, the, the cost of what goes into baking the bread goes up. You can't, you know, um, they don't have to attach strings because they give you the money. You feel happy. You feel attached to them. But the value of what you have goes down. And it's it's most uh, uh, prominent that the degradation of your buying power is among the poor and the middle class. Those are the people that don't have the ability to make things make way to, to make ends meet now. And so if you cannot pay your bills now, giving you a thousand, giving everybody a thousand dollars is not even going to help you one bit to pay your bills. You may get that those bills paid, but all everything's going to go up. Everything you buy is going to go up. Uh, and all of those things are manipulated on purpose. The money supply is manipulated. They can only do it for so long. I'm not predicting any type of major collapse. That's not what I'm doing here. What I'm saying is, is that people are following, falling for these things that are placebos uh, that are supposed to make you feel better about what's going on, but they're really, really not going to make you make anything any better. Uh, and so I, and I've said this before, I'm not a prepper. I do not have massive, I probably have less toilet paper than you do. Some of you that ran out and got some, I didn't run out and get some. So I don't, I probably have, but I'm not worried about it. Because there are, and I was going to, I asked on one of the videos, I can make a video on seven or 10 different ways to not need toilet paper, but nobody on Facebook, nobody voted for it. So I'm trying to provide you with whatever information you need. Hello, Elizabeth from Kansas City. Uh, so say hi when you come in. Great to see you guys. Hope everybody's doing well. So we've been talking about the just-in-time system and how just-in-time is basically a flaw in the system that... Um, it's designed for efficiency. Uh, as you can imagine, let's say you kept no food in your house. Easy to do when things are going well. Uh, you can have Uber Eats deliver food. You can have, um, I don't know, there's several different services deliver food, restaurants deliver food. So long as, you, and, and you have a specialized job that you go do this computer programming or you do this, uh, uh, whatever your, 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 slot is in the overall mechanism you do your thing they give you dollars you take your dollars you don't keep um any hello josh hey by the way everybody josh bernard great musician look up josh bernard and buy some of his music because musicians are being uh, hit particular artists mm -hmm. like myself are being hit particularly hard right now if you have dollars <laughs> that's a place to put it that actually is value so anyways I'll get to your thing in a minute, Wally. So anyways, so you have no food in your house. You do this job. They give you dollars. You use those dollars and you have food delivered or you run to the store and you get your food for one meal or you buy butcher box and they deliver you enough food for your week or whatever it is. And so you don't keep and, and that works perfectly. It is a perfect you can actually get good organic grass fed grass finished this and that. And it works perfectly until it doesn't. So what happens? some interference some thing happens some systemic breakdown happens the food doesn't get delivered uh, uh the the system that delivers it isn't delivering uh they try to patch it up they try to make it work they got um, national guard out there patrolling the interstates making sure the trucks are coming through that works for a little while then the gas station shut down nobody's working everybody is, has been banned from going to work 
those truck drivers, if the truck drivers give up, folks, God bless them too, you know? And so, so what happens is in our scenario, you had this great system that worked, but you depended on it. It's not the fact that you're using it. I don't care if anybody uses it. I would use Uber Eats if they delivered out here, but they don't. But you've depended on it. What would happen? Just I'm just going to act crazy, crazy. Just lose my mind. What if you had food in your house? And people are going, well, I do have food. I've got some uh, pancake mix and... You know, my refrigerator's got mustard and ketchup and blah, blah. Got some ham, got some bacon, got some eggs. But most people have a few days. The power goes out, you don't even have a few days. What if, I'm going to go crazy against here. What if you actually did some research and you found out what foods you could store that take up not much space, that are not very heavy, that you could continue to feed your family and stabilize your area so that you could help other people so that you are an actual productive person. Hey, Cloyce, my brother, I love you. What if you could do that? I mean, this is crazy talk. This is complete. So here's what's happening. I've been saying this thing for 20 years. What if you just thought about it? <laughs> what if you just looked at the information that was available and thought about it and said, you know what? It would be good to have X amount of food, uh, more than that. And and that all, all that prepping stuff is good. I'm not a prepper because I stepped the step back and I looked at that and I go, well, that's not dependent. That's not uh, sustainable forever. In other words, I can have X days worth of food and supplies. Okay. Well, what if I learn some skills? What if I learn how to make stuff with tools? What if I learn how to, to uh, harvest uh, food from the land? What if I um, have cattle? What if I, and I'm not saying everybody's got to go off grid. I'm not saying everybody's got to have cattle. I'm just saying, Take the next step and go, okay, what skills can I learn that would be valuable? Um, more valuable than an than, than entire um, bunker full of food. And so that's where we are. You know, uh, I've missed a few comments and I, I want to uh, scan up here. Uh, all right. Uh, Wally says, can't watch now, unfortunately, but as I've said publicly, I'm not opposed to sending checks. They should be large, should be 200% offset by spending cuts and should come with a handwritten apology. for the, You don't you don't get to say, oh, I'm not opposed to it. As long as this impossibility happens, not going to happen. Uh, I, I'm opposed to sending checks because it's on top of the trillion dollars they've pumped into the market to save the 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 the. Uh, the stock market, the Dow Jones, the the to make the stock market look better. I'm opposed to the $750 billion bailout. There's another $750 billion bailout. And then this on top of all that, impossible to print that much money and not have it de devalue the, the dollars that you already earned, the stuff that you already own, that you've already put your, your days and hours and minutes of your life in it. So I'm against it. But I do appreciate you dropping in and not staying for the whole video so that you could give me your opinion, Wally. Anyways, uh, if you got questions or comments, throw them in there. I'm going to read from my book. I know that one of the things you're never supposed to do is read to adults. But a lot of you don't have anywhere to go. Maybe you're here because you need some wisdom. So what I'm going to do after I'm going to sit here for a minute, give people the opportunity. If you just tuned in, don't miss all the stuff I already said. Go back and watch the beginning of the video. Uh, when this is over, I'm going to put this on YouTube. I'll post the YouTube link. Please share it. Subscribe. Watch the videos. I have a whole series called How We Do Stuff that goes into how we make bread on a fire, how we make bacon, how we make uh, cold drinks in the summer, how we refrigerate things without electricity. All I got videos for all that kind of stuff. So make sure that you're you're watching it. And Cloyce, I'm starting to think that you said I'm looking good because my hair is long. Hmm. Not really. I'm just giving you a hard time. All right. So uh, so uh, if you have any questions or comments, type them in there. Uh, what was I saying? I don't even remember. All right. So I've got this book. It's called Surviving Off Off Grid. There is a companion uh, documentary. I did not make the documentary. It had nothing to do with the documentary. I want to warn everybody there is religion in this book. It's uh, beside the point. In other words, it's my personal beliefs on things, but you can read this and get a lot out of it, even if that's not particularly your thing. 
please do not buy the book and then go give me a one star review because you couldn't stand the fact that I mentioned my own opinion about things in my own book, especially when it's all over throughout all of it. It's even in the description of the book on Amazon. So I'm going to read the just in time. So as a quick recap for the people that just tuned in, um, just in time is the delivery system that we have that basically provides the goods that we need to survive just in time. So it's just like you having no food in your house and getting Uber Eats to deliver, getting Pizza Hut to deliver, getting uh, Subway to deliver. Uh, the, the stuff that you need is uh, just in time. That's why it's called that. And so if it works great until it doesn't work, until there's a run on something, or and then everybody's mad at hoarders when the hoarding is isn't not even a thing it's a made up concept uh and so but you it didn't have to happen because all you had to do is listen to me and people want to say oh he's crazy he's great well who's crazy you know uh I, I, I everything i've said is completely reasonable uh you don't have to uh become a, a survival a survivalist you don't have to have you know, five years supply of food. You don't have to move off grid. You don't have to become a farmer. Just reasonably look at this, at the, the system, find its flaws, find a way not to be dependent on it so that you can enjoy the benefits of it and still be able to provide for your family and your loved ones, your neighbors, your friends, the people that you would like to take care of or stabilize in your area if something happens. So that's what just in time is. And so let me read from my book. This is Surviving Off Off Grid 2011. I actually wrote this in 2009, 2010. The book came out, a little history of the book. I wrote the book on a blog, chapter by chapter. I was contacted by people wanting to get it in book form. I was contacted by an agent who wanted to publish it, decided to publish it by, uh, by myself. 2011, the book went all the way up to top 50 on and on amazon.com in the whole country it ought to be there now but uh people won't share it or t tell other people you'll like the book if you're not offended by my religious positions all right see here we go i'm not going to read the whole thing i'm just going to read this section called uh just in time maybe i can do a reading voice the city was provisioned in much, and this is talking about Rome. This section is talking about Greece and Rome. The collapse of Rome is the, the, the context. The city was provisioned in much the same way that large cities are today. Away from the city, there were clay and stone excavations, gold mines, tin and lead mines, metal forgeries and factories, large granaries and warehouses in the harbor city of Portus, south, south of the city on the Tiber River, stored grains for daily support uh, daily transport for the just-in-time supply of Rome. An advanced system of transport and supply kept the city well-stocked from every direction. Highways and roads, advanced even by modern standards, and some still operating today, allowed for goods to be transported to Rome from all over the known world. With ease, a middle-class shopper in Rome could, in a relatively affordable way, buy spices and fabrics from Asia, clothing and tools from local artisans or from the Middle East, and food from as far away as Western Europe. Most of the cities of, citizens of Rome were employed in jobs that were made necessary by the massive amount of consumption by the citizens of the city. It's not uncommon for a wealthy Roman citizen to employ as many as 50 full-time paid workers, some whose day might consist solely of polishing candlesticks or sweeping floors or carrying things from one place to another. Others worked in factories, shops, thermal bathhouses, restaurants, accounting offices, in the business trades, or in the city's many venues of entertainment. Constant wars and conquests provided the means for a constant flow of money and material for expansion and for the maintenance of jobs in a stable economy. Whereas the Greeks had built their prosperity on Mediterranean trade via its vast network of foreign colonies and trading partners, the Romans supported their economy by conquest and the sword. It is true that Rome had massive slums, areas of poverty and degradation, inhabited mainly by slaves and the poorer classes, but it also had very wealthy districts with upscale shops and boutiques. The Romans, after centuries of living the urban life, 
had little or no concept of how their food was grown or produced. If you asked a Roman how sustainable his existence was, he might reply, Rome is the eternal city. It has always been here, and it always will be here. Whatever I will ever need is available in the shops and the stores. You have to admit, seeing Rome would have been uh, something to behold. If you asked that same Roman citizen from whence his water came, he would have likely shrugged and pointed to the aqueducts. To the Roman, it seemed that freely accessible and plentiful pure water had always just been there. Eleven towering aqueducts, technological marvels built over a span of 500 years, brought cool, clear, potable water into the city from dozens of miles away. I'm sorry, I got a message come in, so I lost my place. Underground pipes brought running water into and provided air conditioning for the houses of those able to afford it. They had air conditioning. They had sliding uh, glass doors. Uh, uh, Rome was a a fantastically uh, advanced place. Huge buildings and structures built by both paid and slave labor loomed over the city streets. The imposing Roman Colosseum, capable of seating 50,000 spectators, was a marvel of engineering and construction. The Colosseum had stood for over 300 years and was the site of gladiatorial conquest, executions, animal hunts, savage battles, and other public spectacles. These were not a backward people. In a marvel of engineering that matches anything done in entertainment today, the Colosseum could even be filled with water for staged mock mock sea battles, with full-sized ships complete with crews. Construction was a way of life in Rome. And much like in our present cities, construction meant jobs, and it gave a sense that things were always going to get bigger and better. But at the turn of the 5th century, even the Romans did not know and could not have conceived of it, of it uh, but the end was very, very near. The thought of disaster would have seemed implausible to a Roman. Rome had not fallen to an enemy, enemy army in 800 years. And even though cultural and social memories and historical awareness were much greater back then, it seemed as if Rome, the eternal city, would indeed continue on for centuries more. Sorry about my hair. The Romans juggernaut uh, was both hated and feared by friends and neighbors alike for hundreds of years. And it could be said that much like America in er in the early 21st century, world opinion had ceased to be favorable for the lone Western superpower. By the end of the fourth century, Many of the barbarian tribes had begun to unite against domination from Rome. The Visigoths had moved into the Eastern Roman Empire to escape persecution and subjugation by the invading Huns. Led by Alaric, the Visigoths and other barbarian tribes now found themselves subjects of Rome. And from the Romans, they suffered from persecution, high taxes, government intervention, and corruption and forced conscription. Uniting together against Rome, the barbarian armies on several occasions besieged Rome, and in the year 410, the eternal city, that shining, wicked, prosperous, arrogant city that sits on seven hills, fell to the barbarian hordes. The destruction of Rome was unthinkable, but the unthinkable happened. Rome indeed fell. Most of the people starved, died of uh, disease, or were killed during the siege, but hundreds of thousands of refugees fled into the countryside as Rome Rome was uh, sacked and burned. Mm -hmm. What was life like in the city before the fall? During the sieges of Rome by Alaric, there were three in all. Starvation and disease killed tens of thousands of people. And the city descended into a maelstrom of bloody violence, robbery, and even cannibalism. The Roman leaders continued to hold the spectacles and gladiator battles uh, uh, during the siege in order to keep people's minds off of their miserable condition. Only now, instead of being satisfied with the destruction, death, and dismemberment of criminals, slaves, and political and religious prisoners, the people demanded that the bodies uh, of the dead be given to them for their meat. I'm sorry, I got to close out this message. I'm almost done. The Romans ate each other. In a scene that has been repeated many times throughout world history, city and suburb dwellers, angry, starving, and without any practical um, uh, skills, or means of support devolved into pitiless beasts when the JIT means of provisioning dried up. The truck stopped moving, the food stopped coming, they ate each other. Once absolutely certain that nothing could go wrong 
and looking down on those who made their productive living from the soil, when the means of production and distribution of mass-produced foods were destroyed, the people became animals, they died like animals, and or became the food for animals. A hundred years after the sacking of Rome, farm animals grazed in the, in the Colosseum. How's that for irony? Adults and children looked at the towering aqueducts and the fabled city streets and marveled at the technologically advanced society that must have created them. They thought it must have been aliens. They couldn't even imagine it. Another hundred years after that, people were chiseling rocks and stones out of the walls of the Colosseum in order to build rudimentary stone buildings for housing. Many history students look at Roman ruins and believe that the destruction they see is solely the result of time and the elements. But in reality, many of those structures were disassembled or torn down piece by piece for the base materials in them that could be had and used for the bare maintenance of life. Modern cities will likely face the same fate. Students today are taught that the destruction of Rome caused a great leap backwards in technology and knowledge, but wiser and more spiritual minds know that the advancement of Rome was uh, flawed all along. It was a divine object lesson, a real-time example of what, what not to do and how not to live. The historians of Rome had not discerned the patterns in previous civilizations that should have alerted them to Rome's fate. The theologians were busy with issues of power, prestige, art, and money, and thus had neither the time nor the knowledge to understand God's word and what it had to say about Rome. The philosophers either could not or would not see the logical fallacy of a society built on the necessity of consumption and conquest. No prophet could be heard in the hustle and bustle of cosmet cosmopolitan Rome. It goes on. Uh, the advancement of Rome, uh, 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 the advancements that Rome was famous for were built on conquest. They were built on consumption. And that inevitably will be brought to some type of uh, finality. The whole point of all that is we have the exact same thing today. There's absolutely no difference. Uh, if, if you just ask yourself, what does the average person produce? Uh, production is necessary for any society or civilization to be able to keep moving. All uh, wealth in some way, uh, form or fashion comes from the ground. Uh, we add labor to it that increases its value but we cannot continue to consume and co have conquest and build these uh, wonderful uh, uh, shining cities that we think are gonna last forever. And then just in time pro uh, provide food for millions and millions and millions of people and then be surprised when something is interrupted. Not saying this is gonna be the fall of Rome. Could be, don't know. All I'm saying is, is that it's predictable. Uh, if you know history, if you read the Bible, <laughs> or if you just are able to look around and use reason, um, there are uh, problems. Now, as a Christian person, I believe my obligation is to uh, stabilize and evangelize or to be able to, uh, to help other people even when things, even what I'm doing right now, I don't have any money. I'm, I'm poor by every measure. Um, all together, if you took all the money, the dollars that I could gather together into one place, I don't think there's 50 of them. But the fact is I have knowledge and I'm gonna to try to share that with you as much as I can. But this all goes back to the fact that the, the flaws in the system that are evident, someone has to tell you about it or you have to learn about it or you have to see it for yourself, look at it, see what you can do to, it, this. I believe this is gonna pass, I don't know. I don't know, I think it will. But we could be in for some some rough road, and uh, I'm just asking people to start thinking: How can you better provide for yourself and your family? How can you better help other people in times of a uh, uh, interruptions like these? And I'm interruptions, putting it pretty kindly. Uh, I think things are going to get worse. All right, uh, Pastor Don says the butcher at the shopping basket was shocked today that he barely received any meats in this week's shipment. Said he hardly had anything to do today. That's true. And uh, best place to keep meat is on the hoof. If you know what I mean. Come on out if you get hungry, Don. All right. I'm here for your questions. I'm sorry to read to adults. I'm sorry uh, if, uh, but you can get the book. It goes, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of philosophy. There's a lot about 
and then it gets into actual practical stuff about heating and light and food and uh, preservation. And I'm not saying everybody's got to go out there and be a survivalist. I'm just saying think. I think it's reasonable to tell people to think and to be responsible. Uh, the, the whole you know, the whole God helps those who help themselves is not a scripture. God helps those who are in, incapable of helping themselves. But I think you have to read the, all of the scriptures, including go to the ant, thou sluggard. Good one to read. We When we have uh, peace and prosperity, we have affluence, we have means, we have intelligence, we hopefully have kind-heartedness and love to sit there and have absolutely no resources to provide for yourself and your family and your neighbor is not love. It's just not. And I would be glad, although people stopped debating me uh, 10, 15 years ago, if anybody wants to uh, have a debate about it, I would be, I would, I'm your, I'm your Huckleberry. All right. I'm here. Uh, ask questions. I think we are 45 minutes into this, which means we technically the screen is, uh, is, is it glitching a little bit? Maybe uh, that could be, I don't know what that is. Maybe it's me trying to get in close. Maybe. No. All right. Type in questions in the comments. If you don't, I'm going to go uh, say hi to everybody up top before I say I go to bed at 730. I get up at 330 in the morning and I go to bed at 730 at 645. So I'm here for you. If you got questions, comments, uh, please watch this when it's on YouTube. I need the YouTube watch hours. I need you to subscribe, like, comment, share. In the description on the YouTube channel, there's my fundraiser if you want to help me continue to do things like this. Um, and there's other information in there too, including a link to the book. All right. I don't see any comments. Perhaps we, perhaps I have stunned them with my reading of my book. There's a lot of good stuff in this book. I could probably. Um, like do there's also an audio book of this there's an audio book on amazon just get on amazon or audible and type in surviving off off grid michael bunker there's an if you just like to listen it's not me reading it but uh but it's good i get a lot of good comments about it don't see any comments all right y'all appreciate you guys tuning in glad uh, we could all be here together hopefully we'll do another one of these very very soon please 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 go to youtube and subscribe share and all that stuff that sure will help me continue to be able to do this. All right. Thank you guys. I'll talk to you soon.